You can pay thousands and thousands of dollars for a memory seminar if you want one, but you don't need one because I'm going to give you one right here, right now. You already paid for it and it'll benefit you for the rest of your life if you understand it. Memory is something we all wish we had more of. Some people know of a few very exceptional individuals that have eidetic memories, which would be called photographic memory, but that's very rare and not always under control. They don't always photographically remember everything they want to remember. We all have issues with memory. Most people have more issues with memory than they are aware of. Some people think their memories are far better than they actually are. We would see with eyewitness testimony, we can actually make our memories think things we think the memory should think, even when the memory is inaccurate. Other people think their memory is not as good as it ought to be when in fact it's normal. My mom called me in her 50s and said, I think I'm starting to get dementia because I don't know where my keys are. And I said, well, gosh, I must be getting dementia, too, because I don't remember where mine are either. But that's just normal forgetting. She just became more aware of forgetting as she got older. It was nothing unusual, and here she is in her 70s with no dementia. So what you see is that memory is a tricky thing. Memory and pride were fighting, and memory said it was like this. And pride said it could not have been like this. Memory gives in. You all know how much you're deceiving yourselves, how many of your memories are exaggerations and projections, how many of your memories are patched up and distorted for its pearls. Gestalt therapy was his thing. And he was actually not talking to a general audience. He was talking to people with advanced degrees in psychology and related fields. So you may not know. But the fact is, is our memories are exaggerated in some cases. They're projections of our worldviews that are not necessarily consistent with actual reality in other cases. And we patch them up and distort them all the time without realizing that we're doing it. And I'll show you why that is and how it works. And the faintest ink is better than the best memory, which is why you should take notes on anything you actually care to remember because the best memory scenario is not as good as having an actual physical record of what transpired you can go back and double check because that's going to be more accurate so moving into it attention is what we're talking about some of you are paying attention right now keenly others weakly others not at all that's normal attention waxes and wanes for human beings probably on average the peak attention span about 15 minutes and then it wanes a little bit and then it can get so bad that you might even actually look like you're paying attention because we've all trained ourselves to look forward in academic settings and act like we're paying attention and you aren't paying attention at all to what's being said on stage. You know how you yawn with your jaw locked? And you're thinking, man, tonight's going to be cool. That's going to be fun. Or, oh my God, what did I do last night? Who can I call that won't because you're not paying attention. Attention is something you can train. That How to Study seminar actually focuses a lot on how to train your attention. Late selection is how we attend to things. Late selection means that I perceive all kinds of things simultaneously, but I don't pay attention to the vast majority of it. Can you imagine what your life would be like if you actually paid attention to every number and every chair and every arm on every chair and every thermos and every shoe and every person and every hat and every cup and every bag backpack and every notebook and you couldn't live like that right so you scan across visually and what interests you is what grabs your attention and holds it there it's what we call late selection as you're attending to the environment in a very very superficial way whatever it is that grasps your attention is what you're going to hold on to and perceive longer but perception has got to be assumed if you didn't perceive it there's no way you can remember it had to be perceived. Keep it in mind that all we have is models of reality that are transduced from energy outside the body to energy inside the mind, the brain cells firing. We read that as our gauge of what's happening outside the body as reality certainly seems that real to us. It is that real in most cases. But you have to have perceived it. It had to have been transduced from physical energy, external to the body, to internal energy in the mind to be perceived. We got three key processes to pay attention to here. First being encoding. Now we're going to use a lot of metaphor here because we just don't really understand all the processes involved. We understand the processes that occur, but not necessarily why they occur or exactly how they accomplish your function. So looking at some metaphor and some analogy, we look at encoding. If you think about encoding, forming information into a memory code. What kind of code are you talking about? Really, it's a neural code. 
Every time you perceive something, neurons fire. Every time you think something, neurons fire. Every time you say or do something, neurons are firing. So remembering something that happening happened would be neurons firing that fired when it happened the first time so that you would have a reproduction of the original event. Well, it can't be reduced, reproduced if it isn't coded into your memory. So I've got to get information in and code it in a uh, biological, neurological way, and then I have to store it. Storage then is just maintaining this encoded information. We'll see that decay happens. You don't remember everything you did all the time. You might remember what you had for breakfast this morning. If I ask you now, what did you have for breakfast this morning? You, oh, I didn't eat breakfast this morning. Or I had this or I had that. But if I ask you in 10 years, what did you have for breakfast on St. Patrick's Day in 2014? You'd probably be hard pressed to remember it unless something dramatic happened. In which case it may be stored longer than you care for it to be stored. And then you got to get it back out. Well, that's what happens when people are experiencing test anxiety, right? They've studied the material, they've encoded it, they've stored it, and then they get to the test and they blank. And they can't retrieve it. Which is why we have the test anxiety seminar, right? Calming yourself down allows you to access that encoded information that's been stored. You know it's there. If there was no pressure, you'd probably have no problem retrieving it. But the pressure can become problematic if it interferes with retrieval. So we're talking about encoding information, storing information, and retrieving information. Those being our three key processes in memory. So there are a lot of different information processing theories. Uh, the idea that they flow through graduated levels of storage is one we'll come back to so that we'll see that information can be stored at various amounts and various times depending on how well or how deeply it was processed from shallow processing to deep processing.